So let me try to answer your question uh, by sort of bringing uh, some context, bringing some of these things that we have heard together, and then let's talk in that about what it means to be church. And it's a good segue from what Rebecca said, and I thank both uh, uh, Laura Leon and uh, Fulton Porter for the things that uh, you have said to really help us and to ground us in uh, what the issues are here as we go forward. But let me begin by saying this. The COVID-19 crisis, uh, as you each have said, uh, has revealed and has made, brought in full relief sort of the ongoing uh, and often overlooked uh, crises uh, in this country. And this is the crisis, of course, of endemic injustice and gross inequality. This injustice and this inequality, we cannot in any way, shape, or form skirt around the issue that it is shaped by systemic racism and a white supremacist culture and ideology. This, of course, is seen very clearly in the data that uh, both uh, Dr. Porter and Laura Leon spoke to in relationship to the disproportionate impact that this crisis has indeed had on communities of color in terms of not only those who are contracting the virus, but as well as those who are indeed dying uh, from the virus. These realities point to the fissures, the cracks that have been a part of our society long before this virus and that have been ignored in our society. We see that most prominently people have talked about poverty. Well, let's use that as sort of the core of how we're going to understand the complicated reality of systemic racism sustained by a sort of white supremacist culture and ideology. We know, right, that uh, Native Americans, 25.49% 25 of Native Americans live in poverty. 20% to 21% of African Americans live in poverty. 17% to 18% of Latinx Americans live in poverty, compared to 10% of white Americans, right? We know, for instance, that one in three black children live in poverty, one in four Latinx children live in poverty, compared to one in 11 white children who live in poverty. Now, no one should live in poverty, but we see the disproportionate uh, realities, and that is a reflection of the systemic uh, racism. Now, when we talk about poverty, we are talking about, as I've spoken before, a culture of death. Poverty does not breed life. It does not foster life. It does not nurture life. It fosters and breeds death. And so it should be of no surprise whatsoever when we in fact see, as you see in Chicago, these conclaves of poverty that are producing more out outcomes that really are reflective of death. And so because when we're talking about poverty, we're talking about a lack of adequate housing, a lack of adequate employment, a lack of uh, quality educa uh, educational uh, opportunities, and we're talking about a lack of recreational opportunities and obviously a lack of health care. So it should be no surprise that we are seeing people talk about comorbidity, right, as if 
something's wrong with uh, the way in which people of color take care of themselves and they aren't as concerned about their health as others. We've even heard people speak of the fact, well, people of color need to learn how to shelter in place during this crisis. That's almost laughable cons uh, considered as uh, other panelists have pointed out, the realities uh, which uh, uh, don't allow us to shelter in place in terms of the fact that we are essential, non-essential workers. I like to say we're the essential, non-essential. And so, and, and let's think about homeless and other vulnerable communities. So here's, here's the point, which of course, uh, Ms. Leon pointed out, and that is this, that, you know, people who are considered essential frontline workers beyond the medical workers and others are really treated as non-essentials in our society. And so I, that's why I talk about the essential non-essentials. Yes. So this is a reality that has been present long before the COVID crisis. So we talk about a readiness in our country politically, et cetera, with the government, a readiness for uh, addressing this uh, pandemic. Well, we aren't in as long as there is this kind of injustice and inequity and inequality in a society, then we will never be ready. We will never be ready for a pandemic of this nature. And so we see that, right? So what is revealed is that we call ourselves a democracy, a nation for liberty and justice for all, well, that claim is really aspirational. That's an aspirational claim. We aren't a democracy. Yes. Well, here's the thing when it comes to the church. This injustice and inequity has happened on our watch. It has happened on our watch. So to call ourselves church is also, as many of you have heard me say before, but now we see it in full relief, it is aspirational. And so we as a church, faith communities are being called to account. This COVID crisis not only calls our so-called democracy and our government to account, it most especially calls us to account as a church and as a faith community. Now, now why? And, and to answer your question and to build upon uh, what Rebecca said, what, what is it that makes us even more, and, and, and I believe this to be the case, even more responsible and accountable than we would say of our government, because we have to bring them along and call them account. As a faith community, we are the only community that by definition are not accountable to the way things are. We are accountable to the way things are supposed to be. And that's God's most, uh, the just future that God has promised us all. And so the fact that we could even in any way, shape or form form compromise with such unjust and inequitable conditions means that we have betrayed what it means to be a church and what it means to be a community of faith. Faith partnering with God in trying to mend the earth and moving toward a more just future. So by definition, that's who we're supposed to be. Now let's talk about who we are as this sort of Christian, the Christian part of our faith community. Well, our presiding bishop has called us into the Jesus movement as Episcopalians, right? So here's the thing about the Jesus movement. The Jesus movement is a movement toward God's more just future. However, this movement goes through the cross, right? And so we are the, a faith community with a daggone crucified savior at the center. Now, 
And, and, and so it would seem that we would kind of take that seriously. And to take that seriously, the meaning of the cross and that that movement goes, Jesus didn't run around the cross, he got nailed to the cross. And so that that movement goes through the cross indicates Jesus' utter, uncompromising solidarity with those people, the most vulnerable, those people with their backs up against the wall, those people on the very underside of justice. That means for us that any discussion about justice has to begin with where Jesus is in those most vulnerable communities, listening to, learning from, understanding what justice means for them. So, you know, it's one thing for those who have a little modicum or, or, or have been privileged with some sense of, 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 of justice or some sense, sense of privilege from an unjust system. It's one thing for us to begin to talk about what we should advocate for. Well, no, we need to be proximate with the people who are on the very underside, right? And to listen to them into their struggles. So what does that mean for the church? And it seems to me that as long as we claim to be church and claim to be a part of a Jesus movement, well, that's where we need to be. That's where the movement toward a more just future began. The inequality that has been revealed within our wider society is also a part of our church. And so that we have churches uh, who are, for instance, able to go online and have uh, live streaming, et cetera, et cetera. That's just an example to show the kind of inequality and that we, our churches, those churches that are more well endowed or have more resources need to begin to take partner with churches uh, in that don't have those resources and they need to and typically those churches are also in communities uh, that are of course don't have the kind of resources that are on the underside of these realities and so I think that this calls for a new model of being church a new way of being church and that the Episcopal Church's challenge is to not live into its legacy of being the church of wealthy slaveholders, uh, but to live against uh, that legacy and become church. But I think we have to recognize the ways in which even our this crisis has revealed the inequalities in our church. And finally, I'll just say, yes, we uh, must be bold, uh, advocates. And, and this is advocates. We need to repair the breach between the way things are and the way things are supposed to be. And we have to find our voice. We Because there's no moral leadership in this country if it doesn't come from the church and faith communities. And so I'll end there. What do you say to folks or congregations who feel helpless or directionless? I don't know what to do. I don't have the power to do anything. What would you well, say to those folks? Yeah, well, first of all, that you do. <laughs> uh, to, uh, and that you can't, uh, no one can expect to solve the whole problem, but we've got to say, what is the one thing that I can do, all right? And so you are never powerless. You are never uh, just, and I always say, imagine the people that are overwhelmed by the conditions that they are forced to live in. And so, so we have to ask ourselves, what in our little garden, in our little corner of living, what is the one thing that we can do? And so there's always something that we can do. And of course, it all also always begins with educating ourselves. But I don't know, we just, we don't have to solve the whole problem. But we also don't have to, uh, add to the problem by doing nothing and using the excuse of it's all too much. I, there's nothing I can do. That becomes an excuse that indeed sustains the kind of injustice that we see. So my thought is just ask yourself, what one little thing can I do? And then it will 
will build out from there. There is something that we all can do. And then also recognize that we aren't an individual. We're a part of a, a, a community. We're a part of a church. And uh, one thing about a church is institutional, right? And so let's function within uh, the community. But I say there's always something we can do. Uh, yes, there's always something uh, that can be done. And if nothing else, we have a voice and we have a vote. Uh, uh, the other thing uh, that I just want to say is that what we should be focused on, yes, is always acting against that which is unjust. And we also have to uh, act toward that which is more just. And so we have to ask ourselves as well. It's easy sometimes to simply protest uh, and protest we must. But the harder thing is, is to plant the seeds for a more just future. And so what are the ways in which we can plant a seed toward uh, the future that we know we are called to?